All right, if it's not recording, I'll just do it again sometime. So welcome everybody. Thanks for taking your time to, to come out and uh, be with us tonight for this presentation. Uh, my name is Guy Galante and I'm gonna be uh, presenting tonight about co coexisting with coyotes. And um, I'm really excited to do this with you. I wanna share with you a little bit about my um, background. So I'm a credentialed teacher. Um, I, I was a youth education director at Soilborn Farms for a, a little over 10 years. I have a master's degree in recreation administration. I'm a UC uh, certified UC naturalist. I'm a published wildlife photographer. I have a small business called Roots of Connection. Um, I've been a parkway advocate for almost 20 years. And um, basically I'm an environmental educator and most recently I've joined the um, Project Coyote uh, wildlife educator team. So I'm pretty stoked about that. Um, so I'll be speaking to you from a place of knowledge and observation. I often get introduced as a coyote expert. Um, I know a lot about coyotes, uh, but I've been doing this a long time. So most of what I'm sharing with you tonight is through, um, uh, through just uh, observation and research on my own. Um, and so let me get rid of that there. So I've been photographing coyotes in the American River Parkway for about 15 years or more. And I've seen everything, so I think, from really sweet tender moments of two little puppies um, getting together and, and sharing, sharing a sweet moment. And also um, some not so great moments where an off-leash dog and the coyote had a confrontation. Uh, there, no dogs were hurt in that. And it turned out that this dog here was just a pup and very curious. Um, but it's, it's, it's frightening to see that uh, playing out in real time. Um, because I've been doing this work for so long and in specific places in the American River Parkway, I've gotten to know certain coyotes as, as individuals. And um, this one here uh, is my favorite coyote. I, I was able to observe him many times uh, over the course of five years. I do believe he's deceased now, but I, I did call him One-Eyed Jack or OEJ. And I found it interesting. I started Google mapping him of where, everywhere I saw him just to kind of figure out what his, his deal was. And then um, people started calling me. Um, hey, we saw five coyotes in the, in the parkway the other day. Um, uh, you know, is it usual to see that many um, coyotes? And um, wait a minute, I was afraid of that. So, um, so I went out there and started uh, looking around like five or seven coyotes, huh? And so what I would do is I walk around and I monitor the coyotes and I see, okay, did they really see seven coyotes? And in that particular case, I can't go backwards to the slide for some reason. It turned out it was three coyotes who were just circling around, uh, scent marking, it was mating season. So people call me, oh my God, there were seven coyotes out there. So I go out there and check it out. And I'm really curious, I Google map it and try to figure out where they're going. And most of my work started in the American River Parkway. And so then what I started doing was doing what I call coyote forensics. So I will look at coyotes um, pictures side by side because they look so different in day and in shadow or at night or even in the season, and I look for really identifying markers, like um, this particular one has this very distinct white band here, or a, a very um, prominent little arch under its eye. And so I wanna get to know, like, are we seeing transient coyotes or are we seeing resident coyotes? So I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, another thing that I've been doing is studying scat. Now, just so you know, coyotes aren't pooping out pennies. Those are there for scale, okay? Um, but you can learn a lot from scat. For my saying is, well, they're at where they scat, um, and they scat where they're at. And so you can always tell what kind of fruit is in season um, based on coyote scat. So in the winters, the last few winters, I've noticed they're eating a lot of oranges. In the summer, right about now, you're finding a lot of plum pits. And uh, earlier, um, we're still seeing fig, uh, fig seeds in the droppings too. Um, but the reason why I point that out is because last year I saw a pile of scat I'd never seen before, and it had these large marble-sized uh, things in it. So I was like, hmm, what is this? And there's a, a Facebook group called Animals Don't Cover Their Tracks, and I posted this picture, and I got all kinds of ideas from palm nuts to other things. And one day I was driving down the road, 
when people were telling me, wow, I'm always seeing a coyote around the evening time running up Harrington Way. So I thought, hmm, I wonder what, why it's going up there. So I'm driving down Harrington Way and I happen to see a loquat tree. So I stop and get out and look at the fallen fruit and sure enough, it was an exact match um, with the, the pit of the loquat was what I was finding in the scat. And that's really important information because a lot of people wanna know why are coyotes going into my neighborhood? Well, um, coyotes eat a lot of fruit. And so this coyote had somehow found that there was a lot of loquat um, droppings on the ground there. And so uh, what I now do is I drive around neighborhoods and I look for fruit trees and start documenting that. So I can better understand, one, how the coyotes are getting into the neighborhoods, and two, what is really attracting them into there. So why, why am I here today? So in 2017, and I'm not sure when exactly the next door um, neighborhood app happened, uh, but I started uh, getting a lot of texts and emails that there was a lot of talk that people's cats were going missing in the neighborhoods. And this is a very real thing. I mean, I have a pet. Pets are part of our family. And to lose a, a pet to a wild animal in your own neighborhood, um, let alone just losing the pet, is traumatic. Um, and so I always offer my condolences to those who have lost pets because I know that it's a very real um, thing and there's a lot of grief around that. And that triggers a lot of um, anger as well. Um, and so there's a, often a lot of discussion about when the cats go missing um, in the neighborhoods. Coyotes are partly to blame for that. Um, they're not solely to blame for that, but coyotes are often solely blamed for that. So I want to clear up a little bit of that, but I'm not going to say that it's okay and that it's um, that I don't have empathy or sympathy for that. That's a very real thing. As I mentioned, I have a pet, um, here she is, my best friend, and if something happened to her, then um, I would be totally devastated uh, too and, and angry as well. But that got me really interested in the suburban coyotes. It kind of pulled me out of the parkway and into the neighborhoods to really start finding out what's going on there. And then around the same time is when I started to notice that coyotes were getting hit by cars. This one is on Fair Oaks uh, Boulevard, and actually there's another one on Fair Oaks Boulevard currently. And uh, oh, hold on. I'm going to check and make sure if I need to add anybody in here. I'm going to admit all. There we go. And so I, I just got concerned. First of all, the coyotes are going into the neighborhoods and now they're also um, getting hit by cars. So it was a dual thing to say, why are they going into the neighborhoods? And then um, it's unfortunate to see coyotes getting hit by cars, especially if they're coyotes that I've known for a while and then I'm finding them dead on the street. I want to know how to prevent that. But I think what really pushed me into this work was when I found a deceased coyote in the American River Parkway. And it was the first time um, that I had, had actually been that close to a coyote. Um, a friend called me and I spent probably an over an hour of photographing it because I had never been able to get that kind of uh, look at its feet or, or, and I also wanted to know why it died. And I noticed when I was observing it that it bled through, it was bleeding through its nose. So I looked it up, long story short, um, that's a symptom of when an animal has been uh, poisoned. Uh, in this case, we had C we, I contacted CDFW, who came out, um, collected the, the uh, carcass and did a testing on it and did determine that it died of direct ingestion of poison. It doesn't mean that it was purposely poisoned, but it means that the coyote had been able to access poison and consume it on its own. But this was also happening at a time on next door when people were saying some really uh, disturbing things about what they wanted to do to the coyotes. I know it's an emotional topic, um, but this was happening. And so I thought, you know what, this can be prevented. Um, also, it was very personal because I had watched this coyote grow up over the summer. So I was very familiar with it and it felt personal, but I also realized that uh, poisoning animals, if you're poisoning rats, you're poisoning all the animals that can consume the rats too. And so I reached out to Project Coyote and that's when I really started diving into this work with them. So I'm um, working was work, they've been great. Um, but right now what I'm doing is I'm very immersed in a very unique situation that's happened in Midtown Sacramento where um, coyotes have moved into a, a sidewalk den along Capitol Avenue. Now, we uh, animal control will tell you that there are already several coyote dens in Sacramento Coyotes are usually way more secretive and elusive about this thing, but this particular coyote denned up literally right next to the to Capitol Avenue in a patch of ivy, and it drew a lot of attention. Uh, people were posting pictures of the den site on next door. I've never disclosed the exact address, but after a while, people started knowing what it was or where it was, and it was getting a lot of public attention. And so 
The challenge with this uh, particular coyote is that she is a single mother. We uh, last sighting of her mate was in February. So she's had two pups that she's raising her on her own in a place that she is very not wanted by some. Um, and so uh, here's a picture of the area. Um, if you can see my mouse, this is the mound of the den here in the patch of ivy. And here's a side view. So we were able to have animal control block the sidewalk off to keep the public from going up there because dogs on retractable leashes were naturally curious and sniffing their way up there. And that's when mama was showing uh, normal behavior in protecting her pups. Uh, I think the, the, the way the story was told is the coyote was going to attack me. And that's one thing I want to clear up is that what the coyote was doing was exhibiting normal behavior and defending her pups. Luckily, there was no contact with the dog or the dog's owner. Um, so we have had the sidewalk blocked off for three weeks and people are getting really tired of that. And I understand. Um, and I will share with you that this den, the birthing den here has been abandoned. As far as we know, there are now spider webs covering the opening, which tells us there, are, there is no traffic in and out of it. And we also place flour, uh, actual baking flour, um, animal control did this, um, uh, around the entry point to see if we could identify any new tracks. And then another um, deterrent is apple cider vinegar, which was uh, placed around the den opening as a way of deterring the coyote from going back. And she has moved not very far away, but still needs to go a little farther away, hopefully 10 blocks north. And I'll, I'll talk about that. Again, I'm going to check my uh, participants and let everybody in. There we go. Getting the hang of this. So I'd be remiss if I didn't show you some pictures of these pups. Uh, I have not shared these publicly um, because this is getting a lot of attention on my Facebook page and I didn't want to encourage more people to want to go out and see them. The, the pups are very small and young, but there are two and they're really cute and there you go. You're welcome for seeing that, if that made you happy. So this has been a, a full-time job for me in the last three weeks as a volunteer. Um, so I'm in daily communication with the, with the city of Sacramento through the chief animal control officer. Um, I have uh, reached out to and, and had uh, communication with CDFW on a limited basis, but they are really talking to the chief animal control officer, but they are well aware of the situation. Um, I've joined a group called Wildlife Watch, which is put on by CDFW, and it involves internal and external organizations who are coming together to have a coordinated plan on how to deal with the things that we're going to be talking about tonight. Um, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Services has gone out to observe the site, um, and ultimately what was determined was that this coyote is not aggressive that um, non-lethal uh, removal was, or lethal removal was not recommended. So those were wins in my opinion. Um, not everybody's happy with that, I understand. Uh, we've talked to most of the residents and property owners within the immediate area and we have canvassed both sides of the street, uh, east or north to L Street and um, south to N Street and um, given out materials from Project Coyote, um, door hangers, or we've spoken directly with people. Some of you in this meeting are part of that team who have made contact with them. Uh, I did present uh, to the Neighborhood Association, the Friends of Capital Mansions, um, to let them know what's going on because they're immediately um, impacted by this. I'm in regular communication with Project Coyote's executive director who's uh, taking information from me and sending it on to their science advisory. And then she's giving me back information that I can communicate to all these people that are involved and they can make a decision based on a lot of input. Um, I've also talked to the wildlife resource specialists in Davis. He, they have implemented the coyote management plan, which I'm going to talk about. And most recently I've talked to the wildlife ecologist who specifically deals with coyotes in the Presidio and all these people I've been, have been great. And now we've formed a team of volunteers to help us monitor the situation. Ultimately, what we want is public safety, public human safety and pet safety first. And then we want to be able to uh, encourage this coyote to go somewhere more desirable. The preference would be to uh, a green space. So I'm here because we have this problem in Sacramento and it's becoming normal. And But it creates this huge wave of 
concern, and rightfully so, there are concerns that come with this problem. So we're analyzing it and we're, and we're coming up with a solution. Um, I think though we, we can't solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. So some things that I'll be communicating tonight is how are we contributing to this problem? Coyote just isn't coming here for no reason. And so without laying any specific blame on any specific person or group, we really need to look at this collectively. If uh, whether you want them or not, coyotes are going to be around and there is a way to handle um, them. So let's talk about wildlife management issues um, and talk about traditional, what a wildlife conflict is, is defined as a situation that causes a health or safety issue to residents or unacceptable damage to town or city property. Okay, that's how it is, uh, it is defined. When we have wildlife conflicts in the past and currently, we use what would be called, considered traditional management. And traditional management involves trapping, relocating, shooting, or poisoning. And it's all contextual. So we're not putting poison out around the city of Sacramento purposely to kill coyotes. Um, there are definitely regulations for where you can and cannot discharge a firearm. There are uh, laws about relocating um, coyotes or other wild animals. And there are strict rules about trapping. Um, basically though, if you trap a, a, an animal, um, it needs to be dispatched. Um, if it's going to be released, it needs to be released within a certain distance of where it was caught. Um, everybody that I, not everybody, but a large number of people were like, why can't we just relocate them? Um, the, I have a blog about that on create-roc.com, so I won't go over all of that with you, but basically relocating is, is not optimal management because the coyotes or the animal that's moved will also often try to get back to where they were taken from, and a large percentage, we're talking 90% or more, of, um, of, of relocated animals often don't survive um, their first year, um, they will get hit by cars. Other problems is if you just take a coyote and plop it down and her kids somewhere, and you might be putting it into a, a territory that's already established by coyotes, and, um, or the coyote doesn't know where to find the resources and the adult and the kids could starve. So that's just a quick thing about relocating. Um, if you wanna know a, bit, a little bit more, if you're really interested, there's this incredible book called Coyote America by Dan Flores, and it goes over our over a hundred year history of our, um, uh, back into the, the days of the Aztec uh, civilization, um, the history of the natural history of coyotes, but also in the last 100 years, the uh, incredible attempts that have been made to eradicate coyotes from the face of the planet. And what they found is that uh, eradication doesn't work, it actually, had them come back a little stronger. You'll have to read the book or at least listen to it. So now we're looking at optimal management ways and the optimal, more optimal ways, the more effective ways that uh, folks have figured out is that non-lethal deterrents are preferred. Um, you don't have that secondary poisoning, you don't have people firing off um, guns, etc. cetera. Um, they have been found to be more effective now, some people might say, well, shooting it's pretty effective because this situation's un making me uncomfortable and I just want it gone, but it actually can end up leading to more coyotes because if you take out one of the alphas, the, uh, the other coyotes might mate more and, and have more babies than what you had before. So it's like, you know, it is more effective. It's a longer term solution. And basically what I'm gonna talk about next is one non-lethal uh, uh, measure is education and outreach and a hazing program. So what is an education and outreach program? When we're talking about education and outreach, we're, we're really understanding the how and the why. How are the coyotes accessing our, our spaces or the, the urban and suburban neighborhoods? How do they get there? And then the other question that we really need to address is why are they going there? Okay, we know they're there, but we have to go back and understand the why and the how. And the education and outreach, like this presentation, um, guides us towards that. But education and outreach also um, involves coyote behavior and ecology. So learning more about the coyotes, learning what's normal and abnormal behavior, just understanding the animal because so many people react with fear, but they're coming from a place of 
of not knowing. And if they know a little bit more, they might have, uh, they might still be scared, but they might have a place of understanding a little bit more. And then education and outreach helps us understand what are the human influences and involvement in this. Okay, so let's, let's take this to a more uh, a different level. When I was preparing for this presentation back in February to give in, in March, um, it was a time when uh, somebody had photographed uh, two coyotes, probably this female and her mate, chasing two cats. Uh, I believe it was on C Street near 22nd, C or D area. Um, and so I went down there and um, my, my dear friend Robert was telling me about this uh, Smud E station and uh, it's about a 15 acre site. Here's the old station, station here. So I went down to the site and I also uh, drove up and down several of these blocks between 28th, the entrance to Sutter's Landing and 20th Street, because I wanted to understand if, how are the coyotes coming into this neighborhood here. And so uh, here's, here's a uh, primitive way of doing this with limited technology. So I got on Google Maps and I just started marking uh, simply where people told me uh, where the pictures were taken and exactly where people had seen coyotes. And so I looked at the access point. So you have a very clear access point into the neighborhood here at CN 20th Street with the, with the uh, what is it, the Sacramento Northern uh, bike trail um, access point there. I put a tent there because uh, I didn't actually feel comfortable going up there. There was several uh, illegal campers there. So I didn't wander up that way. But another access point is here at the entrance to Sutter's Landing. And then there are numerous access points into this particular neighborhood along the levee here. I believe there's a community garden right here, these two parks, and there's a couple of opening open ways for the coyotes to get into the neighborhood. So this goes back to the, how are the coyotes getting into the neighborhood? Is this the only way they're getting into the neighborhood? Probably not. Is this a likely place for them to be getting into the neighborhood? Probably. Um, are they being displaced because of this co uh, construction work happening here? Probably. Um, but I'm saying probably because I don't really, really know. But these are um, pragmatically thinking that, that that could be a way to do it. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the human influences here. Here's a picture of my, my house. Okay, now um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm somewhat embarrassed to admit that I have a rat problem at my house. Um, they don't come into the attic or the, the, my living spaces, but they, year after year I'm having rats um, frequent my yard. And it's really disturbing because they'll dig big holes and if I'm watering with a hose, the water goes right through and into my neighbor's yard and takes the soil away and they'll pull the irrigation apart. And, uh, and they've been getting very bold lately. And so I was like, I can't just go out and kill rats because I'm telling people not just to go out and kill coyotes so I can apply the same uh, tactics to this. And so while I'm talking about rats, this is something that you can do wherever you live to see if maybe you are adding to this, to making your neighborhood desirable. Okay, so I'll just quickly go through these points here. I have native grapes that cover my uh, pool equipment. And so um, I've got to be really mindful of that because, well, the, the rats were eating grapes. And my neighbor here, this whole green patch here, is a grape arbor that's unmanaged. And then, um, you know, I've done some tending for my neighbor while he's gone. He's got this giant garden over here and he's got this abandoned kind of wood pile and open compost area over here. And this neighbor has a, a citrus tree that they don't uh, pick up their fruit. And my other neighbor has a giant plum tree um, that is, uh, I'm still adding people here, has a giant plum tree, they don't pick up the fruit. This neighbor here has a pear tree. This neighbor here feeds the squirrels with a fence feeder and he says he goes out there at night and sees the rats on the fence feeder. And this neighbor here is sending large amounts of water down the street, especially this time of year. I'm thinking about putting some sandbags up and pulling some of it into my pool because um, it's evaporating so fast, but I don't know. What I didn't mark is this is a pecan tree and there are hundreds of pecans in the street in pecan season. And this house on the corner here is just a complete wreck. Um, you can drive by and sometimes see rats on their property. So, you know, I did a whole inventory of my neighborhood to understand what the attractants were um, in my house. I also have wood piles and this is an abandoned, not abandoned, it's this neighbor's uh, garage, but her husband's deceased and he used to uh, collect Model A's. She doesn't use that space at all. So it's like this empty warehouse, okay? So I'm just bringing up these points of like fallen fruit, water sources, uh, holes and fences, um, pecan trees, 
what are the attractants in my yard? And if I lived wherever you do, where there's coyotes, these would also be coyote attractants, especially the bird feeder that uh, I see rats at and squirrels and coyotes eat rats and squirrels. So, you know, if you've got one of those, you've got you've to keep it um, cleaned up. All right, so I took the same tactic when I went down, when I first learned about this den in Midtown, and I started walking every street and every alley within, you know, basically a four block area. And so this is the first thing I saw was a dumpster overflowing with uh, actual food on the ground, okay? Um, uh, because takeout food is so popular right now, given our current uh, situation with COVID and, and restaurants, uh, I'm finding a lot of takeout containers. This one contained half of a, an, of a burrito. And then I found this dumped in the ivy around the corner. Um, this is actually an entire taco and some other food items here. Um, where the den area is located is a plum tree. Um, and there are, we have seen the coyote gorging herself on plums, but also the squirrels are gorging themselves on plums. There's a whole family of squirrels there and the coyotes we've seen chase the squirrels. So it's not purposeful, but it's an attractant which probably made this um, area ideal. Also a half a block away is a giant fig tree with giant figs, a loquat tree um, further down Capitol, and then further up 23rd towards L Street, there's an orange tree with fruit on the ground as well. And then the other day I had the uncomfortable situation where I observed a, a couple uh, who uh, rode up with their uh, cart and uh, pulled out a bag of cat food and dumped it at the base of this tree, the entire bag. Um, and I uh, did not confront them on that because another one of our volunteers uh, did very politely confront someone who was intentionally feeding the coyotes and she was threatened. Um, so I just went over as a casual observer. Oh, what's that? Oh, it's cat food. Why are you pouring it out there? Oh, well, there's raccoons that live in this tree here. We're feeding the raccoons. And they were very excited about the raccoons and they knew a lot about them. But what they didn't, didn't know is that they were contributing to this problem that we're having right now in Midtown. So the only thing I could do was put up some signs. A fed coyote is a dead coyote when you are hand feeding or even unintentionally feeding any wild animal and coyotes in particular, they become habituated to humans, their, their behavior changes, and that's when you have a negative outcome with a, of a conflict between a human and a coyote. A coyote can't tell your white car from a blue car. Uh, so if the white car's guy that's driving in and throwing food out his window every day, every time a, a car pulls into that parking lot, the coyote's gonna think, you're the person that feeds me. Um, it's against the law to feed wildlife. It's the California Code of Regulations, Title 14, 251.1. It falls into the category of harassment. So um, it's illegal to feed wild animals. It changes their behavior. Um, so this is the biggest, I think the biggest thing that we're dealing with right now in Midtown. Okay, so that's all really interesting, I think. So how do we like circle the wagons on this? Well, there's a lot of information about what, how to deal with coyotes out there. And not just because I'm a new wildlife educator for Project Coyote, I, I've been using the materials for years and they have some great resources. You can find almost everything you wanna know at projectcoyote.org and they have a program called Coyote Friendly Communities. Now, some people aren't cool with the word friendly. You know, they'll be like, what do you mean? You want us to be friendly with these things? Like, what are you talking about? And it's not, we don't want you over here, boy, come on. It's not being friendly. It's like, we're really about you being a friendly human in protecting uh, a, an animal on this earth. But I think what's more palatable for most is if we call it a coyote wise community. And what we want is people in our communities to be wise about dealing with um, coyotes uh, coming into uh, their the urban and suburban areas. So what does the, the program like this does? It helps us understand human safety and pet safety. It talks about the attractants that I've mentioned and some of the deterrents, uh, what to do tips and hazing techniques. And another what to do tip is, hey, you have a porch out in front of your house and is it accessible to other critters? Maybe you just shore up that, uh, that fence board or something and that can stop the coyotes or whatever animals standing up under your deck. So those are some of the what to do tips and hazing techniques, which we'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. Uh, a program like this helps us develop a common language and awareness of normal versus abnormal behaviors when we're discussing encounters with coyotes. If we all have, are using a common vocabulary, then we can have actual conversations about this from a place of knowledge. And then 
we need to get this information out far and wide, you know, to residents, to businesses, to the school programs, especially uh, students who live in and around uh, where coyotes hang out, like in Midtown Sacramento, or like I live in Carmichael, so over by the William Pond Park area of the parkway, that neighborhood has coyotes coming through there all the time, so we just need to get the word out. Um, and then it talks about how to cooperate with nonprofit organizations like Project Coyote or local and state agencies that provide educational materials, uh, programs and expertise in dealing with coyote human conflict resolution. That's what a Coyote Wise program basically does. Um, a coyote, an education outreach includes presentations like this, um, but there's also things that you can make, get for free on the internet. Uh, this is on the left is the Keep Me Wild a flyer from, produced by California Department of Fish and Wildlife. And then there's a, a, a fact sheet about why you shouldn't feed wildlife. Um, be coyote aware, facts and safety. Uh, you have a dog. Here's some information about how to navigate the situation when you have a dog. One thing that would be really helpful is if you are walking your dog and you use a leash, um, especially if you're in a known area. Um, and the other cool thing about these is they can be co-branded. So let's say that the uh, Friends of Capital Mansions Homeowner Association wants to do their own coyote campaign within their neighborhood association. We could put their logo on this and that way when the, the neighbor, the residents receive this, that they know that it's not only coming from Project Coyote, that, that their neighborhood association is helping to deliver this information. So I think that's a bonus. And then the thing I like too is the, um, living with or the door hangers that we can put on doors you don't actually have to make contact with anybody but you can get information out to them and then there's these business card uh sized things that you can hand out to people passing by that have just basic things and at least a link to go somewhere else to get more information so education and, and outreach is is helpful but how do we sustain it and create a one-stop shop for consistent messaging and resources on a local level for the long game okay because when these coyotes that we're talking about in midtown move on there's still going to be coyotes coming into midtown and we're going to have the same discussion the next time so how do we address this for the long term so there are a number of cities across the united states who have coyote management plans and i'm going to share with you some real basics about what a coyote management plan is because i really believe that the city of sacramento is at a point where they need something like this if you have had to call animal control or somebody because you've had a coyote encounter or situation, you've probably found that you can't get through to anyone or you really don't know what to do. Um, and so we need to be able to point people to a guiding document about how to manage this in the, in the, for Sacramento because every place is contextual. So management plan and strategy. The goals are to ensure public safety, education and outreach. How do we address areas of concern? And then when we have areas of concern, what's our response plan? And how do we do that within California state law? Okay, the framework of a management plan, it gives us clear definitions. It tells us like a field guide about coyote behavior. It classifies a coyote encounter and how to respond to that specific encounter. And then it offers a uh, hazing information to learn more. So here's an example of the, the glossary basically of, of the definitions about when we're talking about coyotes. Are we using the same words? Are we making sense to each other? Um, so there's definitions there. And these are similar across the board. Uh, most, uh, the Humane Society has a template coyote management plan that you can download and then make unique to your spot. Um, general biology and reproductive behavior. Here's one of my favorite parts. It's the, uh, coyote behavior and classification. So, okay, I heard a coyote last night. Let's classify it as an observation. What's the response? Well, distribute education materials and info on normal coyote behavior. It's normal for coyotes to howl. That's how they communicate. They're called the song dog. They're very vocal animals, okay? Now, you're like, I don't wanna hear coyotes at night or it woke me up, but at least you, it's not hurting you other than maybe losing a little sleep. And then as you can see, um, as you go down, it becomes more and more, the colors change and the paragraphs begin to get bigger about how to deal with that. And then they also include like a, an itemized checklist. Am I leaving pet food out? Do I have a leaky faucet? Or am I sending the water down the street? Is my bird feeder clean? Do I have a fruit tree that I'm not picking up, et cetera. And then there's a basis for a guy uh, for implementing um, hazing program. Okay, now we're not hazing mama coyote, 
in Midtown right now because she has little ones. And uh, if we haze her, she, her kids will follow her anywhere and will most likely be run over by cars. We're stalling as much as we can with public safety in mind so that we're gonna start applying pressure now that she starts to move and we're, uh, our plan is to move her a little bit further north. Um, but we will have a hazing team. So when animal control starts getting called, hey, we're seeing those coyotes now, they're, over, they're all the way up on D and 22nd. I email the hazing team, we go out there one evening, we survey the situation and see if we can find them, et cetera. There's also a way to report incidents. And so this is what's cool is this is a template, but the city of Torrance has an online reporting form. Okay, so you can report coyote sightings and what happened online. And then they have a mapping system. The city of Sacramento is looking at doing this, which I'm very excited about. Anybody can go to this. You can see the sightings. Um, Torrance was having a lot of cat deaths um, and they enacted a, a pretty solid plan. But I love this mapping. It's interactive. And you can see like up here, this is a hot spot. This is where you'd want to put your hazing team out there. Um, Central Florida has a great mapping uh, program where you can look at coyote uh, reports by tracts of land. And you can zoom in and actually pinpoint individual encounters and see what it was. Where was it? When was it? What happened there? So all these points are where people did reports of coyotes. So you can start to see if you went in here and looked at this, you might see some similarities and be like, oh, it's that same coyote. And maybe it's in such a concentrated area. That's where we're going to be doing some hazing. And this California has the coyote cacher. This is how it looks right now. It doesn't look like it's being used very much. I don't think it's promoted as much as it could be. I don't know, but it is uh, done by the UC um, Agriculture on Natural Resources so that we do have something like this in California. But wouldn't it be cool if we had something like this in downtown Sacramento or even countywide where we could actually start to get some data and understand, you know, are coyotes increasing? Are they, where are they hanging out? Why are they hanging out there? We could really start to tackle this uh, neighborhood by neighborhood. Okay, so I'm just about wrapped up here. So here's the next steps. This is an older slide, but this is what I'm doing and we're connecting with neighborhood associations. Uh, the city of course will say we don't have funding for that. So it'd really be nice to find a grant opportunity to fund a coyote program, at least a two to three year thing that we could get, get ahead of this. And then establishing community liaisons. So I have a person in Midtown who's kind of my go-to person because I can't talk to all of you all the time. And so we have people that are talking to people that can talk to me or whoever else is in charge. Um, we're disseminating information and resources and that comes with a, a cost because the printing costs, but we're doing it anyway. And then we're working with uh, the chief animal control officer to do some workshops and trainings in Sacramento and to develop uh, a hazing team, but also to train people on how to haze. And the real time to haze will be in the fall when the coyotes disperse from their uh, parents and they start trying to find new territories. And then finally, uh, not finally, one more, you know, let's get this community action plan going. Let's get a mapping thing going. Let's have an online reporting system going so we can review and evaluate it. And I'm proposing to the city of Sacramento that we do a coyote coexistence or management plan one community at a time. It's going to take a while to do this for the whole city, but we could start with some really specific uh, neighborhoods downtown. So I want to leave you with some resources uh, that I've used. The Urban Coyote Research Project is based at Ohio State University with Stan um, Garrett uh, doing some incredible work um, in Chicago. Um, we have the Urban Initiative, Coyote Initiative, and the Humane Society has some great links too, as well as Project Coyote. And these two books um, have been my favorite books reading about um, coyotes. So, so what, if, what if I was able to teach you something new about this situation um, and that it impacted you? And, and what if you followed one of these links or even just did your own inventory of your own property or your own neighborhood to see like, oh yeah, there's a hole in the fence and they've got a garden. That's a perfect place for a coyote to slip in. Um, and then what if we uh, just work together to really solve this problem the best that we can, or at least minimize uh, what we perceive as a big problem in Sacramento by doing this together. I think it would be a pretty amazing thing. So I'd love to stay connected with you. Um, here's my name, my website, and my email address. If you want to screenshot that or just write it down, I'll give you a second. Um, especially if you live in the Midtown area between C Street and Capitol Avenue, um, we'd kind of like to know if, we're, if, we're, if you're seeing the coyotes in your neighborhood. It could just be casual. It could just be like, hey, guy, I saw such and such coyote at 
the intersection of such and such at this time, you know, um, it would be helpful for us um, for sure. So that's how you can reach me. And um, that is the, um, that is the presentation. I'm going to, um, I think I'll, unmute you or maybe go to gallery view there's so many of you and if you have a question or comment um you can raise your hand at the screen and i can un unmute you and uh you can ask it uh let's see chris and chris let me find your name so i can unmute. yeah oh you can unmute yourself yeah i can unmute myself thank you i really appreciate the good presentation thanks a lot so um i'm the secretary of the marshall new era neighborhood association uh -huh. and I would like to um, hook up with you and be able to disseminate this information to our neighbors in, in our part of uh, Midtown, which basically starts from um, you know, close to Marshall School and down to the Sutter's Landing Park and over to 16th Street, kind of an L around. Um, so uh, I will, um, I think if you, are you gonna, um, give us a copy of this that we could share maybe of the recording uh, yeah the recording will be made available to you um i think it's going to go through fossil's website so uh oh. it won't be sent directly to you it'll be something that can be downloaded um okay is that how you found out about this yeah i wasn't able to um jot down your contact information so uh, i will put my information in the chat screen and then if you get the opportunity to maybe reach out and we, you and I can uh, coordinate how to get some of that information out to our neighbors. That'd be great. That's amazing. Yeah, I'll put my contact information up again um, while I'm taking another question. Thank okay. you. Your name is Chris? Yes, Chris. Great. Thank I've you. really been wanting to connect with you, and you might have already talked to my friend Allison. Um, we're working together on this. Perfect. Thank you, Guy. Mm -hmm. Somebody else want to unmute themselves and ask a question? Quiet crowd. Hi. Yes. Here we go. Uh, a neighbor saw at least one coyote this week, 5 a.m. at 40th and E. It's very, or lots of houses. Yeah. She said coyotes. I don't know how many. Okay. It's great to know. That's a long ways, uh, but it's not out of her range. Um, I, I, I would surmise that it's another coyote, but uh, great. Well, um, hopefully we don't hear about that again, um, <clears throat> but, you, but you might. So thanks for letting me know. So I have a question. Um, I live in a townhouse that is separated from the townhouse by about three feet, a little alleyway. And a couple of weeks ago, I found tails of rats there. Uh -huh. um, so it looks as if something had killed something and eat, eaten something there. I just assumed it was neighborhood cats, but um, now that you're talking about coyotes, I'm curious. I am at 26 and R. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, you're finding the tails. Generally, a coyote would eat the whole darn thing. Um, but, uh, you know, it's coming into your patio to do the, whatever's eating it is you're it's coming onto your property that's where you're finding these tails yes um uh, but it's you know it's it's an alleyway it's not as if it's a front yard or backyard it's just uh you know sort of a dead space yeah i understand okay um i wonder if you you can get battery powered sensor lights um that's actually how i kind of tracked on my rat problem was the lights were going off all the time and it's like mm -hmm. I thought it was a skunk or a possum. I was disappointed. Um, but you know, they're like 20 bucks and you could, you know, mount it to a wall. And at least uh, when the light goes off, when it, when it goes off in my house, I run over to the window, what's out there, you know? It might give you some insight to at least determine. It could be cats, owls, or a number of things. Um, I, I assumed cats, but you know, I'm just, I'm just throwing it out there now. Okay, thank you. How long do uh, coyotes live? Uh, coyotes live uh, from eight to 11 years in the wild. Um, in an urban environment, they're more likely to get hit by a car at a younger age. Um, in captivity, they can live up to 15 years. Um, from what I observed from 15 years of observing in the parkway is uh, I've never really seen the same coyote for more than five years. And that's from um, its 
when it was very young. So there are there is a changing population, especially in these urban and suburban environments. I would imagine in the wild where they can keep their families together and not get hit by cars or poisoned by rat poison that they're a living longer lives. So I live in Carmichael near the American River, like Sarah Court, you know. Yeah. And uh, so would would it, I mean I thought at one point I saw one coming up the hill, walking on the street. Would that be? Uh, I mean, would you see that, them walking in? Absolutely. Like, like I thought maybe it was a, a dog, you know, because it's like, oh, I don't think that's a dog, but it looks a little bit like a dog. That's totally uh, normal. I mean, it's not normal to have a coyote running down your street, but it's very common, I should say, especially over there. I know that over by Sheffield and that area. I hear yeah, coyotes yeah. coming up that way all the time. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, I mentioned at the beginning with the chat that uh, we have seen the skinny female walking at E, and this is Luann Miriam, uh, crossing the street at E and 25th while we were crossing at E and 24th. And so I was thrilled and saw her trot away. And then we almost bumped into her as we continued down 24th Street and she came up to us at D and 24th. So we backed away, we had our dog. Um, and then uh, the dog didn't seem going on, but I was a little panicked, not knowing how he was on. But yeah. she was not interested in us and she continued on down D Street toward, I know there've been a lot of sightings at 22nd Street where one of my family members lived. So, I mean, that was fine. It was just like uh, a sighting. And I like being almost that close up. Well, it's just a thrill to me. <laughs> yeah, it is to me too. And that's the challenge is because I'm a photographer and like to be close, but that's all. But uh, I don't want to haze them, but I'm finding that I have to. Um, so I'm not saying this is about you, but I've recognized that potentially I'm by not hazing um, and being very comfortable myself in the coyote that I can be contributing to the problem because the person's like, the coyote's like, oh, this guy's really cool. I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna get comfortable here. So when did, you did say that it came up to you. Um, it's and, not intentionally. <laughs> okay, well that just prompted me to think that if any of you are still here uh, that I can see um, and a coyote comes towards you, uh, you need to be basically like, hey, bad dog, go away, go away. If, especially if you're feeling very uncomfortable about that, because if you back away, then the coyote's like, I own you, I own you, I own you, I'm coming closer. But if you're like, no, you don't, you know, get out of here. And then if you're regularly walking and seeing a coyote and you've got a small dog, you know, for practically nothing, you can make a shaker with a, an empty can, <laughs> some duct tape and some dry beans. Um, and carry that with you, or even just carry a whistle. And if you want to get really crazy, you can, you know, get an air horn. They won't like that at all. Um, for the person who mentioned maybe there's possibly a coyote coming in or close to your yard, you can spray apple cider vinegar with mixed with vinegar um, around the bases of maybe where you think they're coming into, and that will be a deterrent too. So I just wanted to slip that in there because I know some of you came on here going, "Oh, we don't know what to do." Um, Guy, that was one of my questions. Um, why does it have to be apple cider? Can it just I don't know. be a big jug of, you know, Costco apple cider or Costco cider or vinegar? Yeah, or drunk that stuff. <laughs> it's bad. Yeah. I, um, I don't know. Maybe it just smells more natural to them or something. That you know, I don't know. I just looked up natural deterrence because the coyote pups were going onto one of the neighbor's uh, porches at night and chewing mm -hmm. on um, the, the pillar. And she didn't okay. mind them coming onto her porch. She didn't mind them chewing on the wood. So I looked up right. some natural deterrence. Um, and it, that's just the recipe I got was equal parts apple cider, equal parts regular vinegar. You could also use regular vinegar and cayenne pepper and make a paste out of it and use a cotton ball to uh, spread that on the chew area but not everybody's getting chewed on i mean puppies chew on things <laughs> yeah i also had some other comments um i'm also a wildlife biologist and um since i moved to river park we've had two hideous infestations of rats um and they did a lot of damage to our camping equipment um but uh worst of all they smelled 
um, and I wanted to say it happened in April both times. And um, so the first April was our first discovery and we found a place that they were hiding underneath a cupboard that had a crawl space of about an inch. Um, but the other thing, and so we got rid of that completely. Um, and then when they started showing up a couple of years later, um, we started, I started setting traps and I couldn't set the really big snap traps that rat rats use, but there's a lot of different kinds of rat traps. Um, and I found mouse traps work just as well because they were the young rats coming in. So, um, and now I have some of those sound things that you can find on the internet and I just have it plugged in and it's supposed to be ultra high sound deterrence. So, um, just, you know, some things to think about. Um, mm. so you don't have to use poison. Um, the other thing is, is I think I'm not for sure, but I think that the city has something going where if you're tearing down a building or a shed or something, you have to kill any rats that are inside so they don't go out to the masses and invade the rest of town. So just those comments. They ought to wrangle up the coyotes and let them run around there for a couple of days. Well, yeah, but rats are, yeah, I mean, it's really hard to control rats. And I think if you've got an old building or a shed or something, or even a new building that's being torn down for something bigger, containment of the poison in the building is mm. useful. Difficult. Yeah, well, and useful. Thank you for that, Sally. Appreciate that. Yeah. Anyway, my two cents. <laughs> Thank you. No, that's great information. Somebody asked on the chat if uh, the, the young cubs are likely to stay in the Midtown area since they were born there. Don't they just follow their mom? Yeah, so it's possible that this mom was born in Midtown, uh, possibly last year or the year before when I guess there was a den around I and 25th. I don't know. She seems pretty comfortable and easy to navigate the urban environment. Um, she will, they will stick with mom up until the fall. And so um, that's where the hazing pressure of not letting them get established into a new spot space um, in Midtown, they, they'll probably stay. They'll probably move to half a block away from where they were right now. Um, and that's why we want to monitor them because we want to keep, we want to keep her wary and we don't want her to get her too comfortable somewhere else, you know, in Midtown. I mean, there's benefits to that. And then there's also non-benefits and the consensus is, no, they can't stay here. So they, they've got to go. So uh, hopefully we can get them all to go to a green space and north seems to be the best way. <laughs>